Hello, and welcome to Keith Watts Online Ministries. I'm going to be preaching my message today and downloading it for next week because of Thanksgiving. And uh, But I'm really excited about the message. It's a, a long title, but the Lord's laid this message on my heart. And the title of the message is Prayer Part 13. We are in a spiritual warfare. It is time to get serious about prayer. The text verses that I'm going to be preaching out of is uh, Exodus chapter 17, verse 8 through 14, where Amalek and the children of Israel were fighting each other in a valley. And I want to take a look at this battle. And I tell you what, the battle, the spiritual warfare is raging all over the world. And evil has come out of the closet and is everywhere. Before I get into the message, I want to pray. Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names. And oh, Heavenly Father, I pray that you will forgive me of my sins, Lord, and I pray that you will speak through me to everyone that listens to this message. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you will save millions of souls. Oh, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will save millions of souls across America and millions upon millions of souls around the world before the rapture of the church. Oh, I pray, oh, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you will hear my cry. We are agreeing on earth that this will happen. Jesus, you said that it shall be done for them. And Lord, there are people from around the world joining this prayer chain every day and sharing it every day. And oh, Heavenly Father, I pray, I pray that it will spread so much that a, someone is saying this prayer every moment of every day and touching your heart. And I pray that you will hear our cry. And Lord, I pray for this message. Oh, you moved upon my heart to preach this message. And I'm going to be sending this message out to every pastor and preacher that I can. And I just pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit will speak through me. I pray that I will get out of the way. I pray for the President of the United States and what all is going on here in America. Oh, Lord, I'm so thankful that you are in 100% control. No matter what our eyes see, you are in control. And that is so comforting. And oh, Lord, I just pray that you'll wake America up, our Christians, our churches. Oh, wake them up. Pray for all of our pastors and preachers in America that are struggling so much. And all around the world. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Amen. Oh, I, oh, we need to get serious about prayer. More than ever in our lives, <clears throat> the Lord has moved upon my heart to preach this message. I'm going to be preaching to pastors and preachers, but I'm going to be preaching to everyone. I pray that this message will touch your heart and move your heart towards what I'm going to be talking about, especially at the end of the message. And I just pray that you will watch the whole thing, especially you pastor and preachers. But we're going to go ahead and get started in Exodus chapter 17, verse 8. First of all, we find 1 through 7, the children of Israel needed water. God told Moses, take a rod and hit that stone, that rock, and water come gushing out. And the children of Israel, God, quench their thirst. And so let's go ahead and start in verse 8. 
<clears throat> excuse me. Then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. The, the name Rephidim, and this is the same place where they got the water. They're still there. They're still resting, and that's what that means. The, the name Rephidim means rest. And we find that there is not going to be any rest on the face of this earth as long as the devil is the god of this world. The little G, Jesus called him the god of this world. But he's not God the Father. He don't have all, he's not all powerful, all present, and all knowing. I thank the Lord for that. But we are not going to have rest. The children of Israel thought they were going to have some rest. And all of a sudden, they start fighting in the valley there and start fighting with Amalek. And in, here it says, and they fought with Israel. And I'm telling you, we have a fight on our lives. Oh, it's a spiritual warfare. It is a spiritual warfare. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 6. Hold your place there in Exodus chapter 17. But Ephesians chapter 6, putting on the whole armor of God. Boy, we need that more than ever. Putting on the whole armor of God. So the reason why there's so many casualties in this war is we don't have the whole armor of God on us. But Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, the apostle Paul tells the church at Ephesus, Ephesus, we're not fighting each other, we're not fighting mankind, but what are we fighting? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Oh, I'm telling you, they're everywhere. Spiritual wickedness in high places, those way up in authority that are so pure evil and so wicked, and they're all over the world, and they're controlling so much of the world and trying their best to get full control of the world. Why? So they could bring their prince, the Antichrist, to come and rule and reign over the world and going to worship him and praise him. And so we find that we have a fight on our lives. And I'm telling you, this fight is not over land. This fight is not over power. This fight is, is uh, not over anything. Anwar Sadat said to Israel when he went to war with them, that's what he said. Anwar Sadat, the president of Egypt, told Israel, this has nothing to do with power, this has nothing to do with land, this has nothing to do with money, this has everything to do with our God against their God. And they lost. And they're going to continue to lose. This little God, the devil, he's a loser. He's a loser. And I'm telling you what the devil is fighting over he is fighting over every lost soul on the face of this earth. And he will fight every bit of his being, every tooth and nail. He will fight over every lost soul. Oh, I take a look at how he's fighting over my son to keep my son lost. Oh, I see it. I see it every day. And I cry out to Jesus to save my son. Oh, he's fighting. He's fighting for your wife and son and daughter that's lost, your mom and dad that's lost. He's fighting. And it's time that we realize this and we get in the fight. And the way we get in the fight is the sword of the Lord and prayer. That's all we got. And that's all we need. No, I'm telling you, we need to get into the fight and we need to get more serious about prayer than ever before in our lives. And I'm asking you and challenge you, pastor, pastors, you, I'm, I'm dealing with so many pastors that are over so many pastors in their ministry. 
Oh, and I'm dealing with you and I'm and I'm praying and asking the Lord to touch your heart and move in your heart for what I'm going to challenge you at the end of this message to do. And I just pray that we will get in and start fighting. But we find here that Amalek fighting with Israel, Amalek is the grandson of Esau. You're always going to be fighting with your family. You're always going to be fighting with Christians. Let's stop fighting. Let's start praying. Let's stop fighting and start praying. Back in Exodus chapter 17, verse 9. I want to take a look at it. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out, men, and go fight with Amalek. And I'm here to tell you that you are chosen for this fight. You've been drafted, whether you want to or not. Oh, man of God, woman of God, servant of God, we need to start fighting. Let's, we're chosen. We're chosen to fight. The apostle Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And the apostle Paul fought a good fight. Oh, I pray that at the end of my life, I can say like Apostle Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And oh, we just need to fight. And then in the last part of verse 9, Moses said to Aaron this, this whole verse, he told him, go choose you out some men to go fight against Amalek. And that's what uh, Joshua did. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with a rod of God in mine hand. On top of the hill, on top of Mount Sinai, on top of the hill, the altar to God. And I was thinking about this as I was going over the message this morning. What Moses getting closer and closer to God in body, soul, and spirit on top of the hill. Oh, we need to get on top of the hill. But the other day as I was going over this message, and I preached this message Thursday morning to pastors in India at a pastor's conference. And I was telling them, hey, we are... Something happened on top of that hill. Jesus was hung on top of the hill, Mount Calvary. He was hung on the top of the hill. He bought and paid for our sins on top of that hill. We can have victory in this life through the blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, there was something greater that happened on the top of the hill. Not only did he die on the cross on Golgotha, outside of Jerusalem, on top of the hill, but he rose again the third day, and that tells me Satan is defeated. Satan thought he won when he killed him, and then Satan, I believe, realized for a second he was defeated when Jesus came out of that grave. And I'm telling you here, Moses said, we're going on top of the hill. And so I am so thankful because of the blood of Jesus Christ, there is hope. Oh, there is hope. So they fought with Amalek. We start in verse 10. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him and fought with Amalek. Oh, preacher, pastor, evangelist, whoever you are, church member, it's time to engage. It is time to engage. Oh, and how do we engage? We engage with the word of God. We engage by being on our knees, praying for each other. We engage in this fight through the word of God and through prayer more than ever. And this message is all about getting serious about prayer in our whole ministry. Getting serious about prayer. And so it's time to engage in the enemy. And then in the last part of verse 10. And Moses, Aaron, her, went up to the top 
of the hill. Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill in Matthew chapter 18. Verse 20. How can I not think about this verse when I read about Moses, Aaron, and her going to the top of the hill? 18, Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Jesus is right there. And Jesus is right wherever you are, and, and especially if there's two or three or more gathered in his name, he is right there in the midst. And we find here that Moses, Aaron, and her on top of that hill together for one cause, for the children of Israel to win this battle, to win this battle. And the key verse is verse 11. The Lord laid this verse right here on my heart, and that's how this message came from, was, was dealing with me on verse 11. It's the key verse, and I will actually come back to it at the end of the message. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, hands, Amalek, prevailed. Every time Moses raised his hands, the nation of Israel prevailed. And every time Moses got tired and his hands got heavy, Amalek prevailed. And we find here, raising your hands towards heaven is an act of prayer, an act of worship, an act of prayer towards God Almighty coming from your heart. And that is what this message is all about, is prayer. And I want to come back later to verse 11 when I challenge every pastor and preacher that is watching this message from around the world. In verse 12, I want to get back to it in verse 12. But Moses' hands were heavy. Moses hands were heavy. This fight is heavy. Oh, what a heavy burden pastors and preachers have over the flock that the Lord has given them, the good shepherd has given to the under shepherd to take care of and to help grow and to feed and to water where they will grow in the Lord and get stronger in the Lord and to watch over the wolves that want raving wolves that want to come in and teach and preach false doctrine and get them away and get them out of service of God. And what a heavy, heavy burden it is. I've been a pastor before, and, and I'm telling you, the, it's heavy. But I find it so interesting what her and Aaron did for Moses. Oh, what a blessing they did. It is no accident. Moses, but Moses' hands were heavy. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat there on. Took a stone. I'm reminded, how can I not forget this verse I'm about to read to you? Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verse 11, verse, uh, I'm sorry, verse 10. Jesus is speaking here, and he's actually quoting, in verse 10 and 11, he's quoting Psalms uh, 118, verse 22 and 23. And listen to what verse 10 says. And have ye not read this scripture? Psalms 118, 22. The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. Jesus Christ is the head cornerstone of the church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is known as the stone, as the rock of ages, the rock. 
He is known as the stone, and the church is foundation is Jesus Christ. And we find here in verse 12 that they put a stone under Moses. What is this? The foundation of Jesus Christ. And Moses is on top of the stone. And I'm telling you, preacher, pastor, your 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 foundation of your ministry, of your life, of your preaching, of your teaching is the foundation of the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ, and the preaching of the word of God. And it's not going to work any other way. All the other foundations are sinking sand. You will sink and sink and sink. Is your ministry on the cornerstone, the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ? Him, the gospel of Jesus Christ, died on the cross. He's the only way to heaven. You can't lose your salvation. All the sound doctrines of the Bible that by the grace of God, I'm going to be preaching on here soon on, the, on my YouTube channel. But we find here, Oh, Jesus Christ is that foundation. How in the world is the devil going to win over you? He can't. He can't go against the Savior. He's not powerful enough. He is not powerful enough. And then the last part of 18. And he sat thereon, and Aaron and her stayed up his hands, the other on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Ur on one side, Aaron on the other side. Oh, what a picture of three men of God coming together, not fighting. And they're coming together. And they're helping Moses raise his hands towards God in an act of prayer. To, so the children of Israel can win the battle. We are able to win the battle, but the only way is through prayer. We're trying to win the battle of our own. Oh, we're trying to win the battle of our own. When I was, I had gone over this message the other day, and a pastor, I believe, I can't remember, in Africa or India, sent me this video of this preacher preaching. And he was saying the Muslims preach five times a day. The Jews preach. Pray, I mean, pray five times a day. The Jews pray five times a day and on and on and on. And he was saying, we need to start praying. We need to start praying like never before. I had seen that video right after his two or three minute video really touched my heart because I've been preaching. I was preaching it and I just pray. Oh, I pray. We find here that, that her, her and and Aaron and Moses, they're helping him raise their hands. And oh, I'm telling you, preacher, this is one of the challenges. I believe the first challenge is if you haven't joined the prayer chain for around the world, I pray that you will join it and share it. That's the first challenge. Here is the second challenge. This right here. This right here. It's so precious to me. This is one of the biggest blessings I've ever had in my life. Oh, it's one of the biggest blessings. This is what I call this, my preachers from around the world prayer list. Oh, when I go over it, oh, it just touches my heart. They're asking for food. For the orphans. They're asking for phones so they can use it for the ministry. Oh, preacher, pastor, I challenge you. I challenge you to get each other prayer list for each other and start praying for each other and raise your hands up together. In the name of Jesus, I'm asking you to do this. Start a prayer list. For each other, start sharing your burdens with each other and writing those burdens down and going before the throne of God for each other. Oh, I'm asking you to do this. I challenge you to do this. Oh, preacher, pastor, evangelist, you want God to get out a hold of your ministry. 
Let's get a hold of God. Let's finally get a hold of God. But we find Aaron on one side, Ur on the other side of Moses, and they're together. They are not fighting. They are not fighting each other. They have come together for one cause, and this cause is for Jesus Christ. And guess what? The battle was won. Oh, yes, Israel defeated Amalek, and we could defeat the enemy of God through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm telling you, one of the biggest blessings I've ever had. I'm at work, and a preacher in India or Africa or wherever around the world, Bangladesh, Nepal, the Philippines, wherever they're at, Pakistan, I will start praying for them and praying for that phone, praying for that laptop, praying for the Bibles that they want to give to their new converts, praying for the children's Bibles that they want to give to their children there in their ministry, whatever the case is, to start a Bible college, to finish their church, whatever it is. And I challenge you, preacher and pastor, start a preacher pastor prayer list. For your ministry, and if the Lord lays it on your heart for whoever you run into of preachers and pastors, there's over 200 on that precious list that I have gotten so close to. Oh, what a blessing it is. And then we find in verse 13, verse 13, I can't see. <clears throat> And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Pardon me. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Give me one second. In verse 13, I want to read it again. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. With the edge of the sword. Ephesians chapter 6, again, verse 17. Hold your place in Exodus 17, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation. And supplication in the spirit, and watching thereunto, I'm sorry, and taking the helmet of salvation, I started reading 18, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. This is the sword that we have in our hands. This is the only weapon we got. And I'm telling you, this is the only weapon we need. It's more powerful than anything on the face of the earth. With prayer to God Almighty, how much more power do you want? How much more power do you need? <laughs> but we find here that Joshua and his army discomfited Amalek. How? By the edge of the sword. And I'm telling you, if, if you're not preaching the word of God, you're, you're dead. Your ministry is dead. We need, a, we're, we've got the biggest fight of all times of spiritual warfare all around us. And the only way to defeat it is by the preaching and teaching of the word of God. Nothing else, not our opinion, no other book. The sword of the Lord, the, it, it pierces in where nothing else will reach. Our opinion won't reach the heart. Our opinion won't reach the soul and the spirit. But the word of God will, will pierce the heart of man and make him uncomfortable and uh, praying that he will humble himself and ask Jesus to come into his heart. And so we find here that, that the victory was won. And then... Back in verse 14, I want to read the first part of verse 14, and then the message will be done. And then I will talk to you a few minutes about the, ch the last challenge 
The first challenge, start and join the prayer chain for America and around the world. And for each preacher and pastor around the world, start your own prayer chain, the same one. Because we are agreeing that the Heavenly Father is going to save millions before the rapture around America and around the world. And then the second one, start a prayer list for each preacher and pastor that you know, all the pastors in your ministry. Please start this prayer list for them. And, and here in a few minutes, I'll talk about the third challenge. But in verse 14, the first part of it, and the Lord said unto Moses, write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. What? Here it is, Exodus chapter 17. He wrote it down in a book and here it is. He wrote it down in a book and here it is. And you know what? We need to go back to and write and read. Hey, the Lord gave me victory right here. The Lord gave me victory right here. He's going to give me victory right now, this moment, even though the enemy is all around me and the enemy is so huge and so big and multiplies a whole lot bigger and more than just me. But you know what? God has the victory in his hands. We just need to trust him. And so for a few minutes, I want to talk about, um, I, I, I forgot, I want to read a verse, and it's the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy, the young preacher pastor, Timothy, his spiritual son, and this is what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. He told him, lifting up holy hands. And all through the Bible, it's talking about lifting up hands. And I'm telling you, when Moses lifted up his hands, when praying was going on, the battle was going Israel's way. When Moses got heavy because of the battle, Amalek was prevailing. And so I want to go into the third and last challenge. I challenge every peace preacher, every pastor, every evangelist, everyone around the world. I challenge you. This has nothing to do with about building a channel, YouTube channel. This has nothing to do with about the the views and, oh, I've reached a thousand views. It has nothing to do with any of that. It has everything to do to get serious about prayer because we are in a spiritual battle. The Lord laid 12 messages on my heart on prayer. Three years ago, I decided in my heart I'd become a man of prayer. Three years ago, I, I started really studying real hard about prayer and, and trying to live the prayer. I believe a preacher said, I believe it was E.M. Bounds, how in the world can you preach about prayer when your prayer life is so weak? Oh, I tell you, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Oh, it just, it, it convicted my heart. How in the world can we preach on prayer when we don't even practice? But uh, here's the challenge. I challenge each pastor to take your ministry, every pastor, every preacher in your ministry, yourself, your family, every church member in your ministry, and watch the 12 messages on prayer that's on my YouTube channel. I know some will have to be interpreted in another language, and, and that's happening all over the country, all over the world. And, and I'm finding it so amazing. I keep getting messages from pastors all across Africa and India and Pakistan. There's a pastor in Pakistan. He has my messages, and he, and he uh, runs them, runs the video, and he interprets it in their language. And I, I just pray, pastor and preacher, that you will do this 
if you will do this, your your I believe your ministry will absolutely catch on fire. And no, there's no telling what the Lord could do. But I want to go over a few minutes each message. The first one is the introductory message on prayer. I had six messages, and and the messages kept growing and growing. And today is prayer part thirteen. Prayer part two and part three is focusing on getting right with God. The second one is God knows what is in your secret chambers, your heart, and your mind. And here is your secret chamber in between your ears, your mind, and what you're thinking and all of that. And God knows what's there. And that's what that message is all about. Prayer part three is, the title of it is, Praying to Cleanse What is in Your Heart, What is in Your Secret Chamber. And so two and three deals with getting right with God. And so many of us pastors and preachers, even praying and fasting is not 100% right with God. And I'm telling you, we have to approach the throne of God. And the only way we can do that is be 100% right. The Apostle Paul said in Psalms chapter 17, verse 3, he said that that he tried me and he found nothing. Oh, I'm telling you, the first step is to get right. I mean, get right. We don't play around with it. We need to examine ourselves every day. And then after we get right, I tell you what, you're going to want to do prayer part four and prayer part five. Prayer part four and prayer part five has the same title, praying to praise and thank him. Prayer part four and prayer part five. And I, I address this. And the apostle Paul said we are to, we are to Praise him and thank him in song and in, in him and spiritual songs. We the psalmist said we are approached, we are to approach the throne of God with praise and thanksgiving, and we take our long list to him, and we never praise him, and we never thank him. And in our prayer life, we need to get right with God. And then when we get right with God, we need to praise him and thank him. It's steps, and that's what these messages are all about, is steps in your prayer life and getting to where you need to be to prayer part 12. And then in prayer part 6, the title of it is Starting a Prayer Chain Across America. But this, this is all about prayer and fasting. The message is all about prayer and fasting. And I'm telling you, starting a prayer chain in America, us Americans pray and fast less than most of the, of the world. I'm finding that out very quickly. But when I was talking about this to the pastors on Thursday, <laughs> that's what they were there for, was to pray and fast. But I told the pastors, I said, but what about your members? What about your whole ministry as a whole, praying and fasting and getting serious about prayer and fasting, getting to get a hold of God? So after you get right, after you praise, you pray and fast. And then prayer, part seven, having an altar at home, not an idol. I'm talking about a place of worship where you and your family get together and praise God and thank him and pray to him and and spend time in the word and you focus on your family. Oh, it's so important to focus on your family. And I take a look at two families, Abraham, the family of Abraham and the family of Lot. And, uh, And what happened with these families? devastating. Lot was about the only one in his whole family. He's in heaven today. And I know he's in heaven because he was called in the New Testament, that righteous man. His soul was vexed every day. And then 
The next one is prayer, part eight. Intercessory prayer. This message is all about intercessory prayer. And I take a look at the intercessory prayer life of Job. And Job, he was intercessoring on behalf of his friends. And then I took a look at Abraham. And he was intercessory prayer on his enemy, for his enemy. And then I take a look at the intercessory prayer on Moses. And Moses was intercessory prayer on behalf of his nation. And I will, pastor, preacher, I'm asking you to get a hold of these 12 messages because you need to get a hold of intercessory prayer on behalf of your family. Oh, pastor, preacher, you need to get a hold of intercessory prayer on behalf of your enemy. Oh, pastor, preacher, you need to get a hold of intercessory prayer on behalf of your nation. Oh, I'm telling you. Oh, I'm telling you. And then prayer, part nine, part 10, part nine, to get a hold of God's heart. Oh, I'm telling you, God works through prayer. God works through prayer. Oh, I wish I could get this in the mind of each and every one of our pastors and preachers. He works through prayer. And I take a look at Samuel and Moses. Oh, what an amazing two men of God, men of prayer, men of warrior of prayer. And I take a look at their prayer life and examine these two men's prayer life to get a hold of God's heart. They got a hold of God's heart. And then prayer part 10, to move the heart of God. And King Hezekiah and Daniel moved the heart of God. And I take a look at these two men and in their prayer life and why they were able to move the heart of God. King Hezekiah this shows how much God works into prayer. And that battle shows how much God works into prayer with Israel and Amalek. But King Hezekiah, the prophet came to him and said, get your house in order. You're dying. And Hezekiah moved the heart of God and he gave him 15 more years. The Bible says your day of death is appointed and you cannot pass it. But has it, King Hezekiah got a hold of the God's heart and changed his heart and changed his mind. And he's still sovereign. He is still all powerful and still all knowing and still all present. But he wants us to move his heart. Oh, and Daniel was beloved. And I take a look at these two men in prayer, part 10, to move the heart of God. Oh, and then prayer part 11. My testimony on the prayer, I did not want to pray to God. For nine months, the Holy Spirit kept asking me to pray this prayer ne nearly every day. And I kept saying, Lord, it's too huge. I can't pray this prayer. It's too huge. And then I finally gave in. In February of this year, one night when I was by myself in my secret chamber with the Lord, having such a sweet fellowship, I said this prayer from my heart to God's. And I meant 100% of that prayer. And I knew 100% that the Lord, I had faith in the Lord that he was going to answer this prayer. This prayer makes so many people and preachers and pastors and Christians uncomfortable, and I don't care. I want to try my best to do what the Lord has called me to do, and I know it does, but I'm going to say it anyway. I, I, yesterday, I decided in my heart, I'm going to pray this prayer on my prayer list every day, and this is the prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray from this night until the day I die, until you rapture me up with the church 
I pray that I will be a part of at least a million souls receiving Jesus Christ as their Savior. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Oh, and I'm telling you, I April the 28th, I put my first message on the YouTube channel. August the 1st. The Lord moved upon my heart to move this prayer chain. And I'm telling you this, I was telling my mom yesterday or day before, Mom, there's no telling how many souls will be in heaven because of this prayer chain. Have you joined it? You want to be a part of the millions of souls getting saved? Join the prayer chain. But I see what the Lord is doing with his little old bitty ministry, Keith Watts Online Ministries in Covington, Georgia, and I see it. And it's so amazing to me. He has so humbled me every day. And he has spread this, this ministry all over the world and it's growing every day. And he's answering that prayer. We serve a mighty God. He can still cross the Red Sea today for you. He can still hold back the waters for you. What is your prayer that you're supposed to pray and it's too huge? What is your prayer, preacher, pastor? What is your prayer? I'm asking you. The Holy Spirit just laid this on my heart. What is your prayer you're not praying? It's too huge. He can do it. He is able. We always want to tie his hands behind his back, and his hands are mighty. That's why we don't do anything. And then prayer, part 12. The prayer series, final message. That's the title of the message. But this message is all about getting to that place every day. Not just when you're alone at work, but at at, alone at home, but at work or wherever you're doing, you can get into the place. And this place is before the throne of God. And you're praying for someone or something or, or praising him. And you get to that place. Oh, I'm telling you, preacher, pastor, I challenge you to join the prayer chain. I challenge you to start that preacher's prayer list and start really, really praying for each other. And I challenge you, pastor, preacher. Oh, there's so, I'm telling you, there are so many pastors that I am dealing with that are over so many pastors. Oh, I'm just thinking of you. In West Africa, I'm thinking of y'all. In India. I can, I can picture you now. Please get your ministry and start watching these 12 messages. I challenge you. Oh, I challenge you. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will take this message and it will spread all over the world. And Lord, I pray. Oh, Lord, I pray. Touch the heart of the pastors. Touch the heart of the preacher. Touch the heart of the young preacher in Africa. Oh, Lord, in the remote areas of Africa, in the hills of India, dealing with a pastor last night that are over so many pastors, and his heart's desire is to save all of those in the hill country of India, the poor. Oh, Lord, I pray, I pray that you will hear our prayer. And millions of souls around the world will get saved. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen. Oh, message me, my home church, Newton Baptist Church, or Pastor Brother Tony Howarth. Lord bless you.